Hello, and thank you everyone participating in this fourth online lecture about historical and contemporary woodcarvers and guilders. You can find previous lectures on my YouTube channel if you type into the search bar historical and contemporary woodcarving. This lecture will be recorded as well and put online, so if you do not want to be uh, on the video, please disable your camera and microphone now. Be sure that the microphone is off during the meeting, so we are not disturbed by background noises. My name is Lara Domenegetti, a woodcarver and gilder from Italy, based in Norway and host of these woodcarving lectures. Ike is joining me here today. I will introduce him more later. With these lectures, friends and fellow practitioners are trying to create a platform for discussion, sharing ideas and present themselves and their practice. This time, the lecture will focus on wood carving and gilding apprentices in Norway. Since I started my own practice, I was always interested to collaborate and create a network for artists and artist artisans around me. And since I started to work here in Norway, I made it as an integral part of my everyday life. I work and teach in the wood carving and gilding field, two of my apprentices will present today uh, to get together with another two that work with different master companies. They're going to share their own experience as uh, apprentices and how the education scheme functions. I also took the occasion to do these lectures um, shortly before these apprentices and me will join on a trip to Venice together with the students from City and Guilds of London Art School as an international meeting occasion between future practitioners in wood carving, gilding and the restoration milieu. I welcome now Thomas, Ole Ragnar, Eik and Eirik. If you have any questions, please feel free to write them in the chat or hold them for the Q&A after each presentation. Thank you, everyone. So we'll, we will start uh, with uh, Thomas now. Maybe I'll quickly share some uh, images of your work before you introduce yourself. Yeah, um, um, so. Here we go. I hope everybody can see uh, the images. Uh, can you confirm, Tom? Yeah, I can see them. Thank you. Um, well, I, I, it seems that you can maybe describe a little bit yourself uh, what, uh, what you have done here. Yeah, so uh, the top piece, this was a recent, well, I say recent, it was about a year ago. Um, this was a commission that we received at the school at the Allied, where I'm an apprentice. Um, and it's a, a pace or a kind of mantelpiece above the fireplace in the old cabin. And the, um, yeah, the kind of outline of the project was to create a ornament based on dragon steel um, to fit in with a cabinet that the, the, uh, the client already owned which we believe was carved by Lars Shinshevik. Um, so yeah, this ornament, I used a lot of Shinshevik's work to inform the lines and the leaf shapes. Um, yeah, and Ike helped me paint this one. <laughs> that was pretty nice. Uh, then down in the bottom left, we have a replica of the Bursay box, uh, which is a box found from the north of Scotland in Orkney. And this was a private commission I received myself. Um, in the centre we have the Ringerike Crook, this is another commission I received myself um, yeah, to make a reproduction of this uh, artefact found in Dublin. So this one's a small piece that was used as a, a walking stick handle um, carved in a uh, U. And then on the right we have um, yeah, my own kind of interpretation of an Oseberg. Uh, Viking Age chest lid. And yeah, this one I actually used for, I think, Ola Wagner's first wood carving. This was a kind of, yeah, uh, teaching piece for them at the school. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to share now uh, another uh, video that you gave me with one of your works.
Here we go. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> so uh, I'll give you the word. So please introduce yourself. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, I'm Tom. <laughs> uh, currently, I'm the wood carving apprentice at the Allied School and Handwerk Center in Dover, which is very central Norway. And I've been working here for two years now, with one year previously on the VG2 line. Um, and I began my kind of wood carving journey through the living history. In Scotland, I worked as a jewelry maker, um, focusing a lot on making reproductions of Viking Age artifacts, which we'd then take around to reenactment events and sell at the, the markets there. And through, through this kind of reenactment scene, I uh, got into contact with the Lufthansa Viking Museum in the north of Norway, where I worked as a wood carving demonstrator for a couple of years. Um, so yeah, as kind of obvious by obvious by my work and by my previous kind of entry into this wood carving world. Yeah, my focus has very much always been around historical wood carving styles, and a personal goal of mine has always been to try and understand the language of the styles and to yeah use that knowledge to inform my own and personal creative work yeah i had always wanted to refine my wood carving skills because previously i had always been a self self-taught in the wood carving field and i kind of felt like i had reached the peak of what i could achieve on my own so i yeah i wanted to kind of learn properly and then, yeah, the kind of basic skills. Um, yeah, and I was very attracted to Yellide because the styles that are taught there, they're quite, for me, it felt a lot more fitting to have focus on these, the dragger steel and the Norwegian kind of folk art styles rather than the classical styles that could be taught in sitting guilds, for example. So that was kind of my, main attraction, I think, to, to coming to Yellow. Um, yeah. Financially as well, it was always kind of yeah, a bit more fitting for me or a bit more financially viable um, to come to Yellow. As, as many people know who've gone to the university courses, the tuition fees can be very high. Whereas here at Yellow, I kind of worked out that it was um, a lot cheaper for me. <laughs> Already having a bachelor's degree in England, I couldn't really get funding to support another uh, bachelor's degree studying wood carving. Um, so surprisingly, seeing as it's Norway, it's actually yeah, easier for me to self-fund my studies here and pay for um, accommodation and living costs for a year than it was just the tuition fees or studying in London. And then... Yeah, maybe I can uh, join in the, uh, that uh, element as well, because uh, that might be interesting. Because I have been a student at City and Guilds and uh, paying both rent and tuition fees that uh, are rising uh, almost uh, every year. And uh, with... Um, uh, the Brexit situation uh, as well, it, it really adds on top. So by the end of the education, one is uh, highly in depth. <laughs> um, so uh, it, it, uh, it is very appealing to come to Yarlite definitely, or to look generally uh, to courses uh, that are uh, less uh, financially um, Difficult, uh, definitely. How did you like? Um, so it was already in uh, Norway that you find out found out about uh, Yarlite, or was it already in uh, England? Just um, yeah. 
Um, it was already when I was living in Scotland that I found out about Yellowhide. Um, I always had a bit of a kind of dream to come here. Um, yeah, at the time as well, like, again, it was the finances. At that point, the job I was working it wasn't really enough to save um, a substantial amount to take a year out of work. Um, so yeah, it always never, it never really seemed like a realistic option for me. I always wanted to learn more about calming, but yeah, it always seemed very far away. But luckily, with the job I managed to get the blue footer, that's what kind of allowed me to, yeah, having a Norwegian wage, <laughs> kind of allowed me to pay for the school here. Mm. Yeah, and uh, um, how did it uh, continue then in your apprenticeship? Yeah, well, that's the thing. <laughs> um, I mean, it definitely helps. I mean, I'm getting paid while I still am learning. So being paid to kind of educate yourself is very nice. The apprentice salary is, can be very difficult to live off. Um, I'm not quite sure how it is for everyone in Norway, but when you don't have um, a lot of support, it is a very minimal wage. But yeah, like I said, I'm kind of... Maybe you can share uh, how much it uh, actually is for you. Yeah, so I do quite find it quite funny when I talk to my friends at home about how much I get paid because I currently get about 50 kroners an hour. So it works out as about 7,200 kroner after tax, which in England, I think now is about 650 pounds. And I think that's about half of the minimum wage <laughs> um, in England. <laughs> so yeah. I've definitely gone down in salary, but and uh, there we can even add that uh, it has been uh, improved over the last two years because before that it was uh, 45 kroner an hour. My master as well, Evan, he, he went through the same thing. I think when he was a uh, apprentice here, he got paid around 20 kroners an hour. So I think it's something that all woodcarvers have gone through in Norway. <laughs> Do you get like commissions through your master's company or um, yeah, can you set up your own projects? Uh, I know at Yarlight you also teach. Yeah, yeah so well currently I'm in a bit of a strange situation where I'm um, kind of the substitute teacher for my teacher while he's on his parental leave. Um, so I'm kind of on a bit of a break from my apprenticeship. So right now I'm mostly focused on teaching. Um, but yeah, I think it's good to kind of talk about the experience at Yearlight because um, I wouldn't say being an apprentice at Yearlight is quite the same as being an apprentice in a learning business. Um, we have a lot less kind of focus on production and as being an apprentice at a school, it's the main kind of Income for the business is not the production, it's, it's you know, running as a school. So we do receive commissions, but we don't have that kind of really strict, um, yeah, kind of energy to work fast and produce. So that's something that's a bit missing. Um, as much as we try to try to kind of teach, uh, learn that. Um, but. Yeah, in other ways, I think you get a lot more kind of flexibility. I learn a lot more about furniture making and uh, yeah, then, yeah, teaching with the students. And we do receive a lot of commissions. So currently we're working on, after Christmas, they'll be working on a, on the kind of very special project of the UNIS portal reproduction, which is, um, yeah, for the, those who don't know the UNIS portal, it's a very, iconic piece of Viking Age wood carving. And yeah, we're working on reprodu reproducing that. And we also have a commission for the Neslan portal, yeah, which is kind of perfect for me. I always wanted to work on these yeah, big doys and carvings. And 
Yeah, so it's a very kind of mixed system we have at the end. Yeah, but that is also the really fascinating part, probably like, um, I mean, you always have two sides of the medal, but uh, currently at uh, Yarlight, there is, uh, there are things happening also because there are not that many uh, master companies that um, include or that uh, allow uh, apprentices. So Yarlight is getting uh, uh, some of the most prominent commissions currently. Um, so that uh, needs to be said as well. And um, well, uh, I suppose that um, with Yarlight or th with the experience you get uh, with teaching and uh, also um, uh, working alongside with furniture makers and learning from that, you do learn really a a, a variety of skill sets that can really help you to survive in the craft later on. So that is quite uh, good in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, variation is definitely something that we, we get here. Yeah. Um, and I was very fortunate to, um, so yeah, they couldn't fantasy, I think, with the VGC line. My teacher didn't exactly want to take more apprentices. Um, but this was during the COVID period where everything was on lockdown. And I was in the tricky situation of yeah, not really having anywhere else to go. Mm. <laughs> so yeah. Um, yeah, Evan kind of helped me out very much by allowing me to continue here. And at the time, there was no other businesses taking wood covers. Um, I'm not sure how long. It had been like that. I'm not sure when the kind of businesses kind of stopped. But yeah, I think there was at least a few years when Yellow Light was the only place. Um, so it's very nice now to see that you've set up your business and Ola Wagner has yeah, started with Kayasgard and Google. So it's nice to see that. And I hope that there's more options coming in the next few years. <laughs> Yeah, uh, the landscape is uh, hopefully changing, and um, at least at the moment, uh, uh, that is uh, what it's uh, looking like. Uh, it's nice that you uh, also introduced uh, Ole Ragnar. I think if uh, anybody else wants uh, to maybe ask questions now to Tom, they're free to go. Uh, also, Tom, if you want to add uh, something more to your own practice, please feel welcome. Otherwise, I would introduce Ole Ragnar. Yeah, um, I think right now I've said as much as is in my head, but <laughs> maybe through the, maybe a conversation will start through it. listen to everyone else. Here we go, Ola, uh, you can start uh, um, describing your work. I have two slides for you. Yes, um, that one I did for my final exam at the Allied. Um, Kari, where I work, got a really weird assignment where she was to remake like an old um, thing on the top, top front of a roof, um, which had both a compass, uh, like wrapped up in a dragon. So for my exam, I wanted to kind of take inspiration from that and, and draw something of my own with my own interpretation of that, which ended up being that one. And the goal was to keep it easy because I hadn't done all that much or my skill level isn't, weren't that high. So I wanted to have a little less going on with the Acantes and rather try to show that I could master the basic, which I, I didn't, but uh, it was a good practice. Uh, the one on the right is the first drawing um, that I made, which, uh, if you can notice, it's pretty similar to the one to the left, which is uh, drawn by uh, Rolf Haraldsat, which uh, I recently finished. So I just took out the top part and kind of made it easier for me to practice on. And then 
yeah, I didn't have like any plan for the middle, so I just ended up painting on it. Thank you for uh, sharing uh, um, more info about your work. So uh, please uh, go on and present yourself. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm Ole Ragnar. I live in Vogel and I come from Vogel. And um, yeah, I'm apprentice at Kari Oscar. Uh, she is uh, uh, now currently uh, uh, one of um, three places that take apprentices, right? So there is Jarlite, Kari, and me. Um, yeah. How is it to work with Kari? It's, uh, it couldn't be better. It's, it's as good as it gets. Yeah. Um, how did you meet her or found out about her? Um, I think when I was on my first year on the Allied, I I kind of knew about her because she's she's local as well as me, and uh, yeah, I just reached out and I asked if if I could meet her and see see how she made a living and how she went about work and her thoughts on on wood carving, and then uh, yeah, ended up having a lot of contact with her, like in the beginning, especially about like local wood carvers, which is what's done in churches and, and all over the place, because we have a very specific kind of acanthus in this local area. And then um, we just built a relationship, uh, a friendship, and now he's my master. Yeah. Um... When uh, we met uh, again uh, with uh, Kari in uh, Denmark, uh, she was telling me quite a sweet story uh, how she decided to take you in as an apprentice. Maybe you can share that. Yeah, uh, actually, yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of awkward to share it. It's, uh, you don't have to. Uh, it was just uh, quite um, quite nice that she took you in because actually she wasn't aiming to have apprentices, right? No, she she says she has thought about it in the past, but that she yeah has been very particular of whom she would choose and haven't really met any and. There isn't all that many people, I think, that have asked either, but because there isn't many wood carvers, especially not from of a young age. Um, so yeah, I think I just um, was lucky at the right time. Yeah, and just fitted in uh, also with the personality because it is really a lot about uh, yeah uh, the right personalities meeting. Uh, because it lasts uh, two years, the apprenticeship? We're not sure, because um, I don't have any school. I haven't gone to any school, so I, I'm missing... Yeah, I, I think um, I'm doing it in a slightly different way. Um, in Norway, we have like an arrangement where you can... Um, instead of going to school, you can work for five years. But um, yeah, so we're trying to mix all that together uh, and I won't have to do all the classes all over again. That's very interesting um, as a like scheme because it's uh, not really known. And even uh, with uh, my apprentices uh, who will talk later a little bit more, uh, it was really, yeah, we also had to figure out like how long does it actually take the apprenticeship? Uh, and uh, yeah, and even at uh, Yarlight, uh, it is it really uh, varies. Um, so, um, what um, what are you currently working on now with Kari? Um, well, I just finished uh, the clock I showed you from from Rolf. So now I'm. I'm going to start on the drawing, and then while doing that, I will paint. I will paint the clock because she does a lot of painting, and hopefully, I'll 
turn it to. So I'm pretty much painting everything that I'm finishing, or I am painting everything. So yeah, that's that's the next step for me. Mm -hmm. um, is she, it? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. She she's very free, so she as long as I'm working consistent towards uh, my journeyman test, um, I'm pretty free to do whichever projects I want, as long as it's helpful, like for me to learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, like uh, th that is very interesting even for me uh, to know, uh, since uh, I'm trying sometimes to include uh, both of them in commissions, uh, but uh, you work uh, on uh, um, designs, um, redraw them or um, try to recarve them in the most accurate manner? Uh, no, not really. Um... Um, I will, like with the Acanthus, which is pretty much everything that I've done to here, and uh, I will start doing some Draghi steel from Monday. But from now, it's it's been Acanthus, and uh, it's, uh, she, she really wants me to do it the way it's done here in Upadal, because, yeah staying true to the to the previous heroes that that's created it so um try my best to keep it keep it true to them but uh, uh, what i did was actually i wanted to try something different so i tried to carve it a bit more like like rolf tarl satos just he also has a specific style which yeah so I, I tried that one. And, uh, yeah. It's um, also good to learn. Uh, just quickly to, uh, from, to know for our viewers, uh, Rolf uh, Taral said he is uh, one of the, um, uh, uh, how would we say, um, a judge for the Svennebrev. Uh, the Svennebrev okay. is uh, the final exam. Every, every wood carver uh, or in any type of guild here in Norway, uh, it's the final exam that everybody needs to do. And uh, yes, uh, Rolf is uh, one of the judges that is then looking over uh, the Acanthus, the Drage steel, and uh, then uh, one style of uh, of choice. Uh, sometimes uh, people choose Rococo, uh, other times it's, I believe, um, uh, Renaissance style, if I'm correct. Okay, but I think up until now it's been you have to do Acanthus and Rococo, I think, and then you have one style that you choose yourself, and that's usually the drug mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, yeah, but I think it's, they've been talking about changing it a little bit, but I think up until now it you have to do the accountants and you mm -hmm. have to do the rococo i think mm -hmm. um or yeah mm -hmm. yeah um maybe uh, some uh, i don't want uh, to overload you with questions maybe others want to continue or ask you some as well but i was wondering when for example do you start your work day as an apprentice with kari <laughs> yeah um i do Pretty much nine, nine to four, uh, maybe five, or whatever. Um, but usually, like uh, nine to five ish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, do you also get uh, a similar wage uh, like Tom? Yeah, we're in the same thing. So mm -hmm. exactly the same, I guess. Yeah. I, I don't think he. Yeah. Yeah. I think exactly the same. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's hope that maybe with uh, with the next uh, years things are changing. And I mean, it it, it is it needs also to be said that um, uh, it is a pretty strong year this year with apprentices. I don't know if uh, in the past there were actually this uh, this many apprentices like now. Um, so uh, maybe by the amount as well, 
uh, and uh, more voices um, people react or like uh, people in, in, in politics react a little bit more and uh, put the wage a little bit higher. Let's hope, fingers crossed. We have to be heard, kind of, <laughs> that's the thing. Um, yes, uh, but uh, Ola, do you want to add something more or is anybody uh, interested to ask something? Uh, please feel free to do it now. Do you yeah, want to add something? I don't have to add. No. no. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, this was uh, really a fantastic contribution. I will now pass the word uh, to Ike, who is uh, joining me here. So, hello, Ike. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will show again some images of your work, and uh, you can uh, uh, share some uh, thoughts on it. Here we go. Um, yeah, so the the one on the right it was um, from uh, in the, when I did the wood carving year in at Jalein when Lara was an apprentice, known um, a teacher, guest teacher. Uh, so uh, she had us first in one period with uh, more animal ornaments, and then she came back and had uh, this rococo piece. Um, and uh, that was at a later point we had uh, uh, a period with gilding as well so it's also partially gilded it's <laughs> yet to be finished completely but yeah mm -hmm. um, and the one on the left is um, uh, was for the finishing uh, final, uh, exam. final exam thing mm -hmm. and um, so it's mm, uh, and yeah, it's uh, more of a, I guess, a modern take on the birth of Venus, kind of, to have this curtain that goes down on the on the bottom goes out into these shells that she's usually depicted standing in, um, and then have this uh, this curtain going that she's so she's standing by a window, so it's also. Uh, there is a plan to have like uh, some more shells going out to the left on the bottom and then have a rococo frame and then put in a mirror so you can see uh, the reflection of uh, of her face in in the mirror um, but that also is uh, <laughs> is, is yet to be finished completely and then um, yeah the uh, yeah the, her body is going to be in in walnut uh, and, Kept that in one piece so that you can see the like the uh, the grain uh, like go along so like the topographical lines uh, kind of um, going through her body and then the curtain and the and the shells are going to be painted uh, white um, uh, yeah mm -hmm. so I'll continue with the next image there we go yeah and this is. Um, this was my first task as a uh, Lara's apprentice because um, we're currently working on a heraldic shield for a, a family in Norway called uh, Leventhal. Um, so um, the task was to then draw up this uh, this ribbon in uh, uh, in the style of North. German Rococo, yes, seventeen hundred, yeah, seventeen forties, thirties, yeah, um, and then I was told this needs to be <laughs> about about two two millimeters thick, the entire thing. Um, I, I wasn't really sure that was possible, but apparently it is. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this uh, is in in Linden. Um, so yeah. You see up on the in the right corner is this weird construction of pieces that I've uh, glued together to make the the shape and make the most out of the the wood that we had mm -hmm. available around and then um, uh, yeah it was I guess about two weeks of carving or something to mm, get yeah. it, get it done and then um, uh, the other apprentice Eric is has uh, covered it with gesso and then. There's going to be some lettering on it as well. Uh, it's going to be, uh, yeah, put on top uh, in uh, 
on the heraldic, on the heraldic yeah. shield around. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I am. Uh, my name is uh, Eik or Eirik, because to make it easy for Lara to have two apprentices <laughs> with the same name. Um, but uh, yeah, I've. Uh, yeah, I come into the wood carving more from a, a point of wanting to do art in some sense. Um, and I figured going to um, to Yaled before uh, before going into an art academy would would give me more uh, more possibilities because doing three years in an art academy and then maybe coming up with projects that I wouldn't have the necessary skills to do mm -hmm. um, didn't really make sense. Um, so I did um, uh, one year at uh, an art school in Oslo, uh, it's more of a free free year art school. Um, it's called the Project School. Um, and uh, yeah, there I kind of got, <laughs> got my, uh, my joy of learning back a little bit because I've been like, I was sick and tired of school in like fifth grade, I think. Uh, so um, yeah, having the more of the, the freedom we had there with the, there you had a key card to the workshop so you could be there uh, after school hours if you wanted in the weekends and whatnot. And I remember- uh, <laughs> Essential for you. Yeah, yeah I, re I remember we were there. I think we were three people there on like a Saturday evening once and we were talking about it. Like all of us have never really done well in school maybe or never been too happy with school. And now we're at school working with things on a Saturday evening. That's not many schools that can have that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, because it's, I think for me and for many others, like that doesn't do well in school. It's not that we don't like learning. It's just that we don't like the structure of it. Mm -hmm. um, and um, then coming yeah. to Dovre. Uh, yeah, with, and then, uh, yeah. <laughs> then my teacher there was uh, told me, was, who told me about Yale. Uh, and she said that, yeah, this is, uh, and advised me to maybe apply there as well. Uh -huh. uh, and then I did, I wanted to do the woodworking uh, when I went there, but then I figured, found they had, they were just starting a painting course as well. Um, and for me then working <laughs> three months straight of just making ink from scratch, and uh, then that made sense to do that first and then do the woodworking <laughs> yeah, afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then yeah and then i did uh, one year wood carving last year um uh, where i met you as yeah. well um and uh yeah and also is like you have access to the workshop in the evening uh, and uh, there is a bit more freedom uh, than a lot of normal normal schools mm -hmm. um and i think that is really important because like school today is uh, the practical part is um, it's not really there it's just the theoretical part and then I think for a lot of people that just doesn't work um, but uh, yeah and then I was supposed to do the uh, the VG3 this year um, because yeah like now has instead of taking on more apprentices they have uh, uh, a VG three year, so you can do that one year uh, extra and VG three instead of doing it two or three years as an apprentice. apprentice yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so but, and then do the exam basically the after yeah. this VG three year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I remember like already in the when I did the wood carving there, I was thinking like this the VG two should probably be at least three years for mm -hmm. like a year for each style um especially because a lot of people uh who go there are they haven't really done any carving before and uh or not necessarily in the woodworking at all um so expecting people to do that one year of vg2 and then one year of vg3 and then be 
uh, and on top of the styles yeah. basically yeah, yeah then it's... know at least three different styles mm -hmm. really well um and be like done with your education as a as a professional wood carver that is to me that is very unrealistic mm -hmm. um so i was <laughs> as soon as i uh, got the spot for the vg3 i was like i was thinking okay how can i like drag this out for at least two or three years uh -huh. so i can have a longer education because yeah i'm I, i'm gonna need it kind of mm -hmm. um and in norway you can do either the svenebre uh, as your final exam and then uh you are a professional wood carver or you can do like um a partial test where you uh, go into one style if you have a, a good reason for why you cannot do the the entire normal test um, so i had a, <laughs> already had a plan of uh, maybe uh, focusing on maybe rococo uh, for the first year and do the partial test and then maybe do the entire test uh, the year after Mm -hmm. if possible but um uh, for being someone who doesn't like going to school you're actually <laughs> saying quite the opposite yeah so, yeah, so yeah, then uh, um you uh you found another solution um yeah which um, was the apprenticeship yeah mm -hmm. um yeah because i met you again in um, what was it this uh gathering thing in Lillehammer where me and tom uh went um at the end of the year and there i was offered an apprenticeship mm. uh, with lara uh, and yeah that in many ways makes a lot more sense for at least for me um uh, because yeah as an apprentice you get um, you get to deal with clients you get to see how a business actually works um uh, like tom mentioned as well like being an apprentice in the island it's a it's school so they don't get commissions in the same way um, and doesn't have to uh, survive as a business in the same way as, mm -hmm. as you do. Um, and also, uh, like, hours are more flexible, <laughs> at least here, maybe not all apprenticeships, uh, probably most are not, mm -hmm. but um, the hours are a bit more flexible. Um, it's like, uh, because in when you in school you have your hours from eight to four and then any hours you are in the workshop other than that doesn't count for your education mm -hmm. um, so i think last year i was i didn't have <laughs> i don't think i had any less hours than uh, the other people in the class uh, in the workshop but i just as um, as our teacher said like the, the problem isn't that you're not here it's that you're here at the wrong time of day, mm -hmm. kind of you're, mm -hmm. <laughs> you're here mostly like after school. Uh, and um, uh, like the flexibility as an apprentice makes more sense being mm -hmm. able to be here uh, after, yeah, after four o'clock and it actually counts yeah. <laughs> yeah. into yeah. the education. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah maybe um um uh, yeah i'm talking about uh, yeah really details about the apprenticeship maybe you can uh, talk a little bit about mia because uh, we are collaborating with uh, an organization uh, museet i akerhus um which is uh, also um co-responsible for your apprenticeship yeah uh, so all of us apprentices here today, uh, Tom and Ole Ranger and Eirik uh, as well, we are uh, employed by the museums in Akershus, um, who are responsible for uh, all the appre apprentices in the traditional crafts um, in Norway. Uh, and then, so we are uh, an apprentice with them and we are paid by them, uh, but we are uh, they are not responsible for the teaching. They have some some gatherings where you meet the other apprentices. You maybe have some more in depth on uh, on drawing or or something else. Um, uh, but they are responsible for uh, more for paying the salary for the apprentices and also um, helping out with uh, finding somewhere where you can be an apprentice. Uh, so um yeah and they have 
So we get about we get eight thousand kroners a month uh, before taxes, uh, and as they say, that's supposed to be at least for half of the the salary as an apprentice, uh, and then it's up to the company or or business you're in uh, to uh, to make opportunities for you to make uh, money otherwise than that, and also you can take on um, on commissions on your own. The Mia has uh, responsibility for uh, about forty traditional crafts, mm -hmm. so it's uh, and uh, yeah. Now, as you said, we're quite a lot of wood carving yes, apprentices. Yes. We are a total of three in the entire of Norway. Yeah, that's quite insane. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it is. Yeah, um, because yeah. also the the budget that is ava made available for apprentices, it really depends on the amount uh, there are each year. So um, if uh, a certain um, craft uh, shows to not have continuously apprentices, um, the amount of financial support is cut down each year. So therefore it is even more important to uh, kind of get more apprentices or like people interested to become apprentices mm -hmm. and uh, to choose uh, a quite difficult lifestyle, but quite essential for a craft to really survive. Um, so Mia is doing a quite uh, amazing job in that, uh, just to keep things going uh, and for apprentices and for uh, businesses, really. Um, maybe um, talking about uh, that, uh, like keeping things alive, uh, we can jump over to the uh, next apprentice, uh, but um, be, maybe you want to add something or somebody wants to ask a question to uh, Ike, please feel free. No, I'm good, I think. Yeah, you're good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anybody wanting to ask something? Otherwise, I'll just continue with Eirik. Here we go. Yep, those are mine. So the one in the far right uh, is a Rococo ornament that um, you sculpted and that I gilt and also surface treated into an acceptable surface of gilt. And then eventually we um, patinated it with uh, an oil, um, a very thin oil paint. And we dusted it off with uh, attic dust to make it look old. And then uh, the, the two on the left, those are test boards that we are currently doing. I believe it was the first, um, it is the first project that we started. Um, the one in the middle is uh, finished and the one on the far left is uh, a work in progress. It's set to be guilt next week. And uh, here we see, um, well, in middle is another uh, ornament that you sculpted and I guilt. Um, this one was a nightmare to surface treat, believe it or not. Um, this time we used oil gilding to um, get a finish on it. Uh, I think it went really well, actually. And on the left, we have a frame that um, I have not carved this. I'm not a carver at all, um, but um, I have um, gessoed it and uh, made it ready for gilding with a bowl, a clay, clay finish. Um, and it's ready for gilding. We're just waiting for the gold to come in. And on the far right is um, an illuminated angel that um, I did alongside uh, Sarah Davis on a little uh, one week course on uh, illuminated manuscripts. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Eirik. Eirik is uh, my gilding apprentice. Um, so, I'm welcoming uh, this uh, very special apprentice uh, amongst us uh, woodcarvers. He is uh, collaborating a lot uh, now with uh, Ike because uh, for his uh, apprenticeship, it's really important to have materials to gild on, right? So mm -hmm. here you go. Yeah, um, currently I am um, uh, working on the ribbon that uh, Ike has carved. It really is a nightmare in, in terms of delicacy. Um, I have uh, 
I believe I've gotten it to a sort of acceptable level where you can start lettering. Uh, I didn't, um, there is a few fault spots, but I figured that it was probably best to not overdo it and stop in time and then rather go back and do more work instead of going, taking away too much and having to go back, add more gesso and sun it down again. So yeah, and we, um, well, if I can uh, scooch a little bit to the side, uh, you'll see a um, model of the um, heraldic shield that we are sculpting or carving and gilding. Um, that one is uh, Lara's work in uh, sculpture. And so it's just a test piece, a sketch, if you will. Um, and so uh, I think that's going to look really nice once we've actually uh, started a blue thing and have it ended. Thank you so much. Oh, uh, Eirik, Eirik is now showing uh, the carved piece or the one that is uh, still in progress, but uh, yes, mm. uh, Eirik is going to um, gesso and guild uh, later on, yes. Mm. Yeah, it's really beautiful. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, but uh, Eirik, maybe you can uh, talk a little bit about uh, your experience as an apprentice and uh, how you got into it. Mm. Um, I haven't introduced myself. Uh, my name is Eirik Norland Peterson. Uh, I am um, from the north, the, um, one of the top regions of Norway. Um, very, uh, come from a very long line of uh, fishermen uh, uh, and army heritage. So uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, the indigenous um, nomadic uh, uh, culture in, uh, in the background. Although I myself um, didn't really get the, the um, cultural upbringing in that uh, because it um, has become a little bit taboo a few generations back to say that you are Sami and um, I grew up um, after uh, those generations were passed and now we are sort of starting to reclaim it and um, identify with it more again. I have um, attended four arts, no, what am I saying? I have attended two art schools in Oslo over the span of four years, so two years at each school. Um, and then finally I applied to um, and um, as an apprentice, uh, where I wanted to be a gilder, but there was no master to take me in, so I was paired up um, with a lovely lady to maybe try decorative painting, because um, in Norway, gilding really is a dead, dead craft. We never really had much of a tradition for it. So decorative painters are the ones who do gilding, but they don't really do it the proper ways or the way that you would do it further down in Europe. Um, but um, I quickly realized that I should probably not have said yes to uh, become a decorative painter just because I wanted to have a little touch of, um, of gilding in um, the non-traditional way. It's really took a toll on me psychologically and physically. So. I was about one year on a leave before Lara uh, heard about me and um, almost personally requested me. So now I'm with her. Yeah, really, when it comes to crafts like gilding, um, we are really on the brick of extin extinction here. Uh, mm. Though that has also something to do uh, with the history of Norway. Maybe you can add something to that. Yes, a short history lesson. Um, after the Viking Age collapsed and um, Norway entered into a union with uh, Denmark and Sweden in the, what is known as the Kalmar Union uh, under Queen Margaret I. Um, after she died, uh, the union lived, went on for about, um, well, I don't exactly know the exact amount of time, but it went on, on for a little while and then Sweden pulled out of it. And Norway and Denmark were left alone, but um, eventually it became sort of more like Norway was a vassal state of Denmark. So during the Middle Ages, uh, 
or up the post Middle Ages, uh, when the Black Plague hit, decimated Norway a lot, took out most of the population. Um, um, you could say that we had a Danish upper class and um, only very small uh, communities or the biggest cities sort of had uh, money or institutions um, to hire artisans, while the rest of the country was peasants or fishermen. And so this continued on. The Napoleonic um, Wars happened. Uh, Denmark sides with Napoleon, I believe. And uh, Napoleon loses. And so in, um, because Sweden was opposed to Napoleon, Denmark had to cede Norway to Sweden. Uh, we didn't like that, so we tried to de declare ourselves independent. That didn't last long because Sweden just come and took us. And so we were in a union with Sweden for a long, long time until 1905, where we finally declared independence and became our own nation with our own sovereign monarch or constitutional monarch. Uh, so really, um, Norway didn't really come into its own until um, 1905. That's where we sort of started to uh, look for the um, Norwegian identity uh, and um, sort of the folk yeah, folk crafts of wood carving, national romantic paintings, and fairy tales. That's sort of where this, this is sort of the time where this sort of identity as a very close nature people start to uh, really take root. And then a couple of decades passes and Norway become very rich because we find oil in the North Sea. And this sort of starts the golden age of Norway, so we are very, very behind on um, sort of traditional crafts. We didn't really have the classicism. We had um, we were sort of forged in a modern age, in sort of a time where architecture is supposed to be efficient and simple. You, um, as a gilder, uh, what is your future aim? Because your passion lies a little bit outside of it. Maybe you can hmm. talk about that. Well, when I went to art school, I um, started to sort of, um, I created these fantasy drawings where I used uh, gold and silver ink to um, create reflective surfaces. Uh, but I was never really that happy with the outcome and the inks just was very difficult to work with. I needed uh, to really shake the bottles and really try to find the best quality inks with the gold and silver tints to them. But it never really seemed to work. So I tried to um, look into gilding and I picked up a book about icon painting. And at the time I wasn't very interested in it. I just wanted the book because of the gilding section. And I realized that, okay, this is a very, um, this is a very complicated field. That's probably not easy to do, um, just uh, pick up in a week. It required a lot of material components that you had to invest in over time. Um, then I sort of put that to the side and I started another art school. And one of the teachers there, she had actually been to St. Petersburg and gone to the academy there in the icon painting restoration courses. So she was schooled in St. Petersburg as an icon painter. And she did one week of uh, an icon paint, this crash course, and that really ignited this um, flame within me that uh, I found very fascinating because um, I never really thought that much about Russian craftsmanship before. And then that just made me realize how special the Eastern European um, style is and how mystical it can be, especially for one who is grown up in. Uh, a country that's uh, Lutheran and everything is supposed to be simple and to the point and with very little symbol, symbol, sim, symbolism behind it. So I started to um, continue with icon painting um, on the side and um, I still do it and I still want to continue on it in the future. Just right now it's a little bit learning the techniques because there's only so much you can learn on a course and only so much um, you can learn on your own. 
Um, yeah, but uh, mm, it's so fascinating to see you grow, like uh, um, in terms of Gilder, uh, but also as an icon painter, because uh, yeah, you combine both uh, your artistic interest with a very specialized craft and uh, both go along so well. So um, I think, uh, yeah, with you really, uh, we can see flourish again, uh, a craft that uh, for uh, several years uh, seemed uh, to be at its end uh, almost, or uh, we have uh, maybe one or two other businesses that do it, uh, but uh, nobody really is passing it on. So uh, mm. this is quite special to have uh, all of you gathered here. Um, so I think we can actually um, end the conversation here, except you want to contribute uh, um, a few more words or if... Uh, Thank you all for participating in this fourth lecture about historical and contemporary wood carving and gilding. It was great fun for me to have these four apprentices gathered together and talk about their experience and work. I hope you enjoyed it uh, as much as I did. For the next lecture, you will hear closer to the date. Please feel free to spread the word about this network and about the platform and uh, invite other practitioners and craftspeople. Have a great day and I'll see you soon. Bye!